Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. This is a special episode. It's going to be extra long. We have a good amount of topics packed in. We're visiting the Intel HBM on CPU story. Has some interesting implications for the future. We'll also be talking about how AMD is absolutely kicking NVIDIA's ass for last-gen GPU sales right now. We'll be revisiting the new egg story and talking about our upcoming factory tour trip to Taiwan. So, let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and their Silent Wings 4 fans. The Silent Wings 4 fans market themselves as being useful on radiators, tower coolers, and cases alike. The fans have a six-pole motor and use a fluid dynamic bearing, which helps with the noise profile and with longevity. The fans use anti-vibration mounts for reduced noise transfer to the case and have a rated lifespan of 300,000 hours. Learn more at the link in the description below. So first up, our trip to Taiwan coming up. We're super excited about this. Three of us will be spending two weeks in Taiwan. We'll be going mostly around Taipei, Taoyuan, some of the other cities there, and touring factories. You can think of this like a travel special version of GN. We've done a lot of these in the past. We used to do them multiple times per year, touring factories, headquarters, interviewing engineers and interesting people in the industry. But uh, obviously since COVID, we haven't really been able to do that again. So a lot of you have probably never seen those series from us in the past. And if you haven't, we have a factory tour playlist you can check out to get a preview of what's to come. We're super excited about it. There is, it's unbelievable the opportunities we get when we travel to see how the parts we use, all of us every day, are actually manufactured. It gives you a lot of perspective. And the machinery is just super cool to watch work. There's a lot of automation that goes into it these days that's really impressive for uh, for computer components. So we're hyped to bring you those episodes and uh, it's an excellent opportunity for all of us to learn more about how the stuff is made. We'll be learning right alongside you as we put together the story, talk to and interview the people who are the experts, and then show how various components uh, actually get designed, engineered, and manufactured. So that'll be added to our existing uh, factory tour playlist that we have on the channel. And then there's some other fun content we have mixed in. So we're going to look at some prototypes of new products that are coming up within the next few months. A couple of companies have uh, agreed to give us a first-hand look. Some of them are case and cooling manufacturers, and the case industry has been really buzzing lately. So there's some cool stuff to look at there. You'll get a preview of it on our channel before it's even shown in its final state. And additionally, we're going to do some more market tours. Those are always fun because shopping for computer parts in another country is a different experience for us. And it normally lets us see, OK, how do the prices compare to what we're used to? And does that affect our judgment if we were to review it with these prices in mind? So there's lots of other normal content lined up, too. We're probably going to do normal content scattered between some of the Taiwan content. So no, we're not flying back and forth multiple times. It's just there's some stuff we're getting done before we leave. And uh, the 7900 XTX and XT reviews will hit while we're overseas. But because we have people who are, will be doing the testing at home base, plus people who are traveling, we're able now to actually get it all done with two teams in two different countries, which is super cool because we've never been able to do that before. So Patrick will be at home base working on testing and analysis of the 7900 XTX. He's going to send me the data, and then I'm going to work on processing the review, writing it up, and we'll present it and host it in Taipei. So that'll be pretty different, but uh, just giving you a heads up on that. That leads into a brief one for the next topic, which is the GN discount code on the store right now. You might have noticed we ran a few GN store ads the last few videos when we did best CPUs and best GPUs. And that is part of the plan we've been trying to enact over time now for a couple of years at this point, where we try to pull as many third-party advertisers out of the videos as we can as we further establish editorial separation. So when you see ads for our own store, that's a good thing because that means we're able to fully self-fund uh, some portion of that month we were operating without any third-party funding other than from our audience. So right now we have the code. Thanks, Steve. For 10% off everything on the store, we chose that code because when we asked our viewers what was your favorite corporate meme from the last few years, they all chose that one. So thanks, Intel. Now, despite the insane demand we've seen, we still have a good amount of coasters in stock. They make excellent gifts for the holidays coming up. You can grab those on the store and use the code for 10% off. We also have large mod mats in stock and shipping now. The inventory is starting to run low on those. So if you want one for PC building projects coming up or for just a work surface to act as a, a durable, heat-resistant, anti-static surface for your projects, you should grab one now because we will probably be running out within the next few weeks. We also have mouse mats and tool kits available. And it's pretty clear that all that money goes back into the business because we've really expanded our testing capabilities this year. We've hired two people just recently 
who've really helped us to alleviate the content pipeline and start putting out the more videos you've likely noticed while keeping the quality level. And we get to do this overseas trip to show you how components are made. So thanks everyone for visiting the store, store.gamersnexus.net. Okay, first story. AMD is kicking NVIDIA's ass right now on last gen prices. It's not a surprise that NVIDIA and AMD both are trying to purge their previous stock before, well, on NVIDIA side, they probably eventually drop the RTX 40 prices and release lower end 40 series cards. And for AMD, more of the same, really. So it's, it's different that NVIDIA chose to launch the 4090 without a 4080 at the same time. And that's because they were running low on the high end inventory before the lower end stuff, which is evident because there's still 3060s, TIs, 3070s, 3080s in stock brand new, some of them not even released yet. Like Max Sun has some that are coming out, uh, which is interesting because that means you know they probably haven't been used in a mining operation unless maybe they were recovered and refurbed, but that'd be a pretty expensive refurb to give it an entirely new cooler. So anyway, AMD and NVIDIA, their plan's working because the last gen stuff is far more viable and interesting right now than the current gen stuff. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because the second hand market is also getting flooded. So there's some price competition there where you see $100, $150 differences between some of the used cards and new cards. For things to pay attention to, we did that video on best GPUs, uh, but the prices have moved around a little bit since then. So just as an addendum to that, we were looking around, we saw the 6700 XT and the 6700 especially are extremely compelling now. They And the 6750 XT, same family. Those have dropped into the 300s. Um, there might be some even lower than that, but approaching 300 bucks is a crazy good deal for some of those cards. We also noticed some 6600 XTs pop up. We thought they were all gone since they were refreshed by the 6650, but the 6600 XTs, a couple of them we spotted for $200 flat, which is easily the best possible value at that price point. It kicks the ass of the GTX 1660 Super from NVIDIA and uh, the RTX 3050 isn't even close, like 100 bucks more, depending on wh when and where you look. Then as for the 6800 XT and the 6900 XT, those are in a little bit closer competition with the 3080 because the 3080 is still an extremely compelling card. It starts to pull away from some of the AMD stuff at say 4K, and obviously it has a major advantage in ray trace performance, which is true for all of the, the sort of price for price NVIDIA cards. But if you're not that interested in ray tracing and 4K is maybe not super important to you, the AMD 68 XT, the 6800 even, uh, 6900 XT, 6950 XT, those are actually really compelling right now at the prices they're at. And that's mostly or especially true for say 1440 or 1080p high refresh gaming where price for price, the 30 series at like 1080, 1440, it often gets beaten by AMD's competitors in rasterization performance. So the market is actually, it's really interesting to look at right now. This is all following news of being the lowest GPU sales, I don't know if it was of all time or in a decade or whatever, but it's really not a surprise. The same thing happened with the 20 series launch where the 10 series flooded the market post mining collapse at that time. And the 10 series was really compelling. There's still new old stock that they needed to sell. And so you had this influx of secondhand and first party cards hit the market, compete with each other, drive prices down, and oops, the 20 series has trouble moving inventory when it launches. And the same is true here with the 40 series, and uh, we'll see how the 7000 series works out for AMD. Them pushing back that launch might actually benefit them a little bit because it allows the market to purge more of the inventory before the 7000 series cards hit. So that might be a strategic play and not necessarily just a play because they're not ready yet. Now, for us, we're really excited about this because even though it's bad for NVIDIA and AMD, to some extent Intel, they're not really in this market that much, uh, it doesn't actually affect the media in a negative way. It affects us in a positive way because people are excited to build again. They can get into it for relatively cheap. And it makes PC build videos suddenly extremely interesting because we have all these different combinations where there's competition at those price classes. And we're going to be doing a PC build in Taiwan to sort of play with that idea as a, as a video concept and uh, go shopping and build a PC at the current prices. So as for NVIDIA, uh, the, maybe the pressure is just not high enough for them to care to drop the prices. Maybe they have enough inventory that they can wait for AMD's inventory to run out and then they're the only one again. But either way, at the moment, uh, AMD really is kicking NVIDIA's ass pretty much, uh, I mean, at 200 bucks, easy choice, 300, 350, easy choice AMD, 
you get up to the 3080, there's a little bit more variance there. So that's where you have to think about it a little harder. But I mean, other than that, it's just like, there's really, I mean, the 4080 is going to have a hard time right now, obviously. It didn't even sell out at launch day. Okay, next story. Intel announced its first MCM or multi-chip module solutions for data center for CPUs and GPUs. These are under the Max branding and uh, it follows a number of successful years for AMD doing this where at one point Intel remarked that it was gluing its CPUs together, AMD that is. So now Intel's also using glue. Maybe they've realized it's not so bad when you do more than sniff it. So the new Xeon Max CPUs are the Sapphire Rapid solutions that have been in development for a while now. And these are really interesting because uh, they're chiplet based, but they also have HBM on the package, on the rest of the solution. So you've got basically on die memory. The CPUs feature up to 56 performance cores hosted on four dies that Intel calls tiles. And it's also got 64 gigabytes of HBM2E, all connected by Intel's EMIP or embedded multi-die interconnect bridge. The HBM makes this really interesting because it's the first time it's been available on any x86 CPU. And it could be big for memory bound applications. Since there's RAM on the chip, users will be able to choose one of three modes of operation. One of those is HBM only mode, which means running without any traditional memory dims and relying entirely on the onboard memory. Another is HBM flat mode, which allows for use of the onboard HBM and traditional DDR with all of it visible to the OS. This would require software optimizations to take full advantage of the HBM, uh, but it's really an interesting combination. Finally, there's the HBM caching mode. This also uses both HBM and DDR, but with the HBM as a high speed cache in front of traditional memory and it's invisible to the OS. It's like some sort of weird ghost of Optane at this point. So just like any normal CPU cache or the relationship between RAM and storage, like a hard drive, anytime you can keep data ready in faster memory solutions, uh, it's going to speed up processing because uh, it results in fewer cycles wasted where the core is just waiting for new information. So pretty interesting. Intel also claims that the Xeon will be able to perform with uh, improved performance per watt over competing AMD Epic solutions. AMD has just announced its own CPUs. We'll talk about those shortly. And uh, it says that the Epic solution is based on Zen 3. So this would be the ones before the brand new announced Zen 4 solutions are underperforming versus Intel's new Xeon for per, per watt. Uh, the rated TDP for the full version of the Xeon Max is 350 watts. So per socket power is rising in both server and in desktop, as we all know. Intel is claiming a 1.2x to 4.8x gain versus its previous generation in several uh, real world use cases, as it claims as well. Moving to GPUs, Intel's new GPU Max series is the Ponte Vecchio codename design with over 100 billion transistors total for the whole package. The largest GPU Max design has 128 XE cores and 128 ray tracing units, four times as many as in the RK770. And of course, architecturally, they're different as well. So 128 gigabytes of HBM2E being included with 408 megabytes of what they call Rambo L2 cache makes this thing a monster for caching and memory. These will be available in several server specific form factors depending on the need, but also as standard PCIe cards like the GPU Max 1100. The 1100 is similar in construction to the AMD Instinct MI210 that we just tore down with Wendell of Level 1 Techs on our channel. Intel also shared a little bit about future products and products on its announced roadmap at this point, things that are coming up. Uh, one of them is an upcoming data center solution called Rialto Bridge, it's a code name that scales up to 160 XE cores and uh, an insane 800 watts on a single module. So there's your power consumption. The second is the unified package with CPU, GPU and HBM on a board that Intel is calling an uh, XPU and that is codenamed Falcon Shores. Intel provided few details, but this will likely be similar to AMD's Epic-based APUs. On the software side, Intel noted that it's using its new One API to bind the CPU and the GPU together, which is intended to allow software developers to more easily leverage both the CPU and GPU compute simultaneously, depending on whatever works best for a specific load. And just for fun, Intel also showed off a few crazy water-cooled servers in a laboratory data center packed with its Max hardware. Power density is so high right now in these applications that error no longer cuts it, at least not alone. These new Intel Max products will be available in the server market January 2023. 
of course, we don't cover them, but the server-side stuff does work its way into consumer in some form or another, normally within only a couple of years, depending on what it is, how ridiculous it is. So we wouldn't be shocked to start seeing some of these uh, design advancements find their way into Intel consumer products, which is why we like to report on it. Up next, Lian Li has an RTX 4090 case compatibility tool. Uh, this is a pretty quick one. It's amusing, maybe not in the best way, but Lian Li has posted a dedicated page showing compatibility between cases and a couple of different RTX 4090s that we're assuming it bought and test fit. And uh, the tool is simple. It's a drop down. You pick the case, you pick a card if they have it, and it gives you three different symbols. Either doesn't fit at all, definitely fits, and then fits, but kind of asterisk, you need to use a slim cable. It's honestly pretty helpful for either current owners of the cases or those still making a decision. That said, the list doesn't guarantee good thermal performance, so be aware of how close the card's fans are going to be to things like power supply shrouds or glass side panels. Even if it fits, it might still be a bad performance fit. Up next, this may be the most important announcement in the hardware industry that we've covered ever. We briefly alluded to the rumors in one of our previous news episodes, but now we are proud to talk about the, the groundbreaking news. ASRock has brought SANIC to motherboards. Yes, that's SANIC. ASRock is timing the launch of its Z790PG Sonic along with the release of the new Sonic Frontiers game. This is no longer a rumor, it is now actual news. It has an entirely Sonic-themed landing page for the new board. It's the most effort we've seen ASRock put into anything, and the aesthetics are what matter here. The board features a rotating rain pictured on the rear I.O. cover, blue and silver coloring the word Sonic not once or twice, but a total of at least five times. The chipset play also has Sonic's face, and you'll see him on the back of the board as well. So you'll need to find one of those ancient clear plexiglass cases to really appreciate this one. Even the UEFI is especially Sonic themed. Moving on to the technical aspects, we now can confirm as actual news, the V-Core VRM has 14 phases and the rest of the board has several fast features like PCIe Gen 5, 2.5 GBE for networking and support for DDR5-6800. And then we get to the real questions, the existential ones that ASRock has pioneered by asking for us. And at the bottom of the page, if you scroll down, you'll see that ASRock asks, what type of users suit for? Something we've all been wondering, ASRock, for a long time. What type of users suit for? Well, ASRock has an answer. 75% modder, 95% modern gamer, 100% Sonic the Hedgehog lover, actual quote, and uh, we assume that the rest of the marketing goes into Fort Minor's lyrics. Uh, if you're a big fan of the character, PG Sonic is available from Newegg for 250 bucks right now. It's no longer a rumor that that is the actual product listing. Up next, AMD's epic announcement. So AMD had some server announcements of its own, this time for Zen 4 to compete with Intel's Xeon Max announcements of about the same week. And uh, this is for the AMD Epic 9004 series. It is codenamed Genoa, and it is based on Zen 4 architecture that's the same as in the Ryzen 7000 CPUs. The new CPUs range from 16 to 96 cores on a single CPU package with up to 384 megabytes of L3 cache with support for DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. Socket power is up as well. It ranges from 200 to 400 watts. And physically, the 9004 series is on the new SP5 socket, which has a more square shape versus the rectangular one of previous generations back to the first Epics and Threadrippers. Architecturally and just in packaging, these are really interesting because AMD is now packing up to 12 CPU dies with eight cores each onto one package in four clusters of three, all surrounding a central larger I.O. die. So... It's basically all flanking I.O., which if, if you followed Epic or Threadripper at all, you know that that's massive on these. I mean, compared to Ryzen desktop, there is a lot of I.O. on these. And to expand on that, the I.O. die gives a, a crazy 12 channels of DDR5 up to 6 terabytes, 128 lanes of PCIe Gen 5, the Infinity Fabric Interconnect, of course, and various other capabilities. And this is the same approach as previous generations. It's just that it's been scaled up to higher density on newer architecture and smaller 5 nanometer process for the core dies. Now, another interesting thing is that AMD can cut these down all the way to just one core per CPU die, 
which would spread the power and therefore the thermal load across a large surface area. In theory, this would allow a much higher clock in Zen 4 core to perform faster, while still having access to all of the fast I.O. and massive cache for workloads that are much more thread-bound. Whether or not AMD does this or a user decides to toggle the cores this way is one story, but it shows that AMD has a lot of flexibility in doing its architecture this way. And we talked about Intel's claims for servers, largely because we don't benchmark servers, so we can't tell you to check back for our own benchmarks. We won't have any. Uh, it's only fair then that we also talk about AMD's claims. So AMD is claiming up to a 1.9x raw performance increase over its previous generation Epic CPUs, and it has already been working with industry and press partners ahead of the public announcement. So there should be some data out there from people who do testing on it. If you're interested in a deep dive, Wendell of Level 1 Techs should have a video up on the Level 1 Techs channel by now, and uh, definitely worth a watch because the stuff they put out is high quality and top notch for this type of component. As for the pricing and the rest, so 1K unit pricing for the Epic 9004 series starts at just over $1,000 US, and it goes all the way up to 12 grand. <laughs> kind of a large range. Typically, this kind of CPU is purchased as part of a whole server, so it gets a little weird on the cost estimation there. And uh, partners like HP and Asus are the ones who would provide those. They have a couple servers already available. Uh, it's interesting, though, to see the advancement of these high-end architectures and uh, multi-chip designs across the entire market now, where Intel's getting into it. NVIDIA has written white papers in the past, years and years ago, at MCM design. And as time goes on, they're starting to look uh, less and less like the glorified uh, sort of desktop CPUs they used to be. And this is just actually the way of the future for CPUs. Up next, Asus launching some new power supplies. These are the Strix Gold Aura power supplies. Uh, the only reason we really thought these were worth talking about is because they are not only 80 plus gold rated for the 80 plus efficiency testing, but they also got cybernetics rankings where cybernetics performs additional tasks. We've talked about this in our past content. Uh, they go beyond just doing efficiency. They also test for things like protection mechanisms. So 80 plus, although it tests for efficiency, Zero testing for quality of things like overcurrent protection, short circuit protection, overpower protection, but Cybernetics does that stuff. So anyway, ASUS has uh, a Cybernetics Gold ranking for efficiency that's near the middle of their range, a little different than the 80 plus range, and it has what they call an A plus rating for noise. These power supplies, the main features are that they're ATX 3.0 native compatible, and they have native 12 volt high power support for video cards. They ship at 750 and 1200 watt capacities. The chassis is made from aluminum rather than steel, and it acts as an additional heat sink for the unit, something that's fairly common, uh, although in power supplies, most of these are made of steel, so they're not leveraging the full area. There's also an ARGB ROG logo. God, that's a lot of letters that you can control via digital three pin header. I swear all those letters actually mean something. Although at some point we're going to start forgetting what they mean and they'll just, it's just, we're gonna be reading the alphabet basically uh, as we do these news videos. So we don't have the pricing at this time. Power supplies aren't retail yet. They should fall somewhere between the top and the ROG Thor lines. They come with a 10 year warranty for basic functionality and three years for the LEDs, which feels a little bad. Actually, we're about to jump to the next story, but thinking about it for literally five seconds longer feels very bad because it's like the cheapest part. Just, just, just warranty the whole damn thing. Uh, or build it in a way where the user can maybe submit a request for a replacement LED strip or something so they can just swap it out if you're worried about shipping the whole power supply back and forth. Uh, or use better quality LEDs. Or get rid of the LEDs. Uh, up next, Lian Li has new Unifan SLs version 2. So Lian Li has updated its addressable RGB fans. If you've heard of the Unifans in the past, we covered them back when they were prototypes. They've been out on the market for a while now, though. Uh, they can all sort of bridge together to reduce cable clutter by connecting with each other. So the Unifan SL V2 is the new one. It's different from the Infinity Mirror version that you saw previously if you followed these. These fans retain the signature feature of snapping together in series without cables, and now you can also join clusters of fans together with an extension cable. This means up to six fans can be run off a single header on Lee and Lee's controller, which itself supports a maximum of 16 fans. They've also made slight adjustments elsewhere in the design, like slimming down the connectors and bringing the light bars closer together where the fans are joined for a more uniform look. On a functional note, they are thicker than their predecessors at 28 millimeters, which should help with static pressure performance. That very slight, about three millimeter increase in thickness might affect compatibility in some 
very tightly constrained builds, but for the most part, uh, especially in open showcase style builds, it's not going to make a difference, uh, at least in, in terms of compatibility. Now, the new SLs are available for $27 for a single fan for 120 mil, $30 for the 140, uh, or as a three pack 120s with the controller, $90. Up next, some news about FFmpeg, OBS, and AV1 support. AV1 has been a big topic. Intel pushed it pretty hard because they were first to market with sort of a complete set of AV1 encode decode options in hardware. Uh, NVIDIA and AMD have been pushing it as well now. And OBS and FFmpeg have both added support for NVIDIA's new hardware AV1 encoder. And that's found on the RTX 4090 and future 40 series GPUs. In the case of FFmpeg, the speed uplift was reported as 75% to 100% with the AV1 solution. So pretty good. AV1 is basically the successor to H.265. It was developed by the Alliance for Open Media. AV1 promises better video quality at lower bit rates, as well as overall efficiency improvements. Hardware AV1 encoding was first introduced to the desktop by Intel with its Alchemist GPUs, but with relatively few people buying those, NVIDIA's implementation will see far wider use. And these RDNA 3 GPUs will also have support for AV1 later this year. For OBS Studio, you need to be on at least version 28.1 of the latest Windows release, no Linux yet, and use a 40 series card. In FFmpeg's NVENC AV1 update, the developer noted findings from preliminary testing saying, quote, the encoder seems to be trading blows with HEVC and VENC in terms of quality at low bitrate CBR settings. It seems to outperform it even. The quote noted that using the slow preset, AV1 NV encoder outperformed HEVC NV encoder in terms of encoding speed. That's that 75 to 100% number. And they said, needless to say, it always massively outperformed H.264 in terms of quality for a given bit rate. Now, we haven't tested it yet, but it, and it's only a matter of time at this point until AV1 starts taking over. Uh, it is a lot more efficient. So it's where things need to go. It was just a matter of hardware support and software support catching up with each other. Now, the next story here is a revisit of the Newegg story that we ran a couple weeks ago, but now with new information. So previously, we put together some coverage of a Reddit thread where the user claimed to have received weights from Newegg rather, or at least somewhere in the chain between Newegg and the customer, rather than a GPU. Actually, we, we have those weights. So just to show them, because people are, I mean, it, it's, a curious issue, so it's worth showing. Here is weight number one. Here's weight number two. This box weighs the exact same as this box with the GPU and the accessories inside of it. It does not have the GPU inside of it, though. That's what's in there. So we did get the weights in. So previously, we pulled that story because we became uncertain about it about 15 to 20 minutes after publishing it. I killed it super fast as soon as I had even an inkling of being uncertain because that's what we try to do here. We try to make sure that the coverage is good. So we were pretty confident in the research, which included talking to Newegg and the customer. But then some early YouTube comments came in that made claims about the Reddit user's post history, and we also had a lead on getting the weights in from the user. Now, those claims in the comments about the user's post history came out to be inaccurate and basically misrepresented. So it sort of felt like a waste of our time and a waste of of a video really to pull it based on that. But in the pure sense of the word waste, it wasn't because we learned some valuable lessons from it. We'll talk about those in a minute at the end of this section. Um, but uh, the suggestion was that the user who made the claims about the weights is a CNC machinist, which in itself is innocuous. Um, however, because of what, I don't know if that's aluminum billet or what that is, but because of what the, the weights look like, I think people were connecting CNC machinist. These things look like things that would come out of a CNC shop, therefore fraud. I was able to independently verify the user's profession and it is not CNC machinist. So if we could stop making things up on Reddit, that'd be great. So those comments were just flat out wrong. Uh, but it was worth, I mean, looking into it anyway, once we got that information. That's what we're talking about here today is like, I want you all to know that as soon as I see new evidence that makes me question something and I don't think I have an answer for it, I am totally fine absolutely just killing a video, posting an explanation, which is exactly what we did, uh, and following our process to make sure what we put out was correct or if it wasn't to fix it. So that's what the process was. Um, parts of it feel wasted, you know, parts of it not because we get to show what our 
uh, behind the scenes plan is for the situation. But obviously it kind of sucks to then find out that the commas pointed us down a rabbit hole. Um, but I do take some fault for not like feeling 100% confident in it. We'll talk in a minute about that. So um, those comments weren't accurate. Now, the other comments, there were some, uh, two of them specifically that I saw before I pulled the video that suggested the user participated in subreddits about fraud and about defrauding companies. And uh, that was one of the reasons we're like, okay, let's just look into this and make sure that that's not true or if it is that we change it. So none of those comments were accurate. We weren't sure at the time though. And uh, ultimately after a week of looking into this, we've basically, we were finally able to root cause these two, uh, first 12 high power cables, now internet comments. We were able to root cause these two claims back to two individual Reddit posts that misattributed a few things. One of them, a 3D printing post by the user was misattributed as the user being a CNC machinist, very different things. Um, and secondly, the one about uh, the alleged participation in subreddits about fraud, we were unable to find any evidence for that. We contacted a couple of the people who made those claims. They did not provide any evidence of that. Um, I suppose it's possible there were deleted comments. I couldn't find any. There's a few tools out there for that. It seemed to no one had screenshotted that. Uh, and so anyway, it, we just, we weren't able to confirm that particular claim. However, the fact that I'm using qualifiers right now, like I couldn't find any, we didn't get any screenshots, we couldn't confirm it. That's enough reason to explain why we were like, okay, let's just pull the video because I'm not sure enough to leave it there. So we see this every now and then, like for some of our recent reviews about uh, GPUs, for example, I saw a few Reddit comments that were doing a TLDW that inserted some uh, data that wasn't ours. I don't know where it came from, but we didn't say those numbers. And they'll still get upvotes on it because uh, it's a TLDW, the people DW. And so if the comment is written, confidently enough and seems reasonable, it just gets upvoted. And that's how that misinformation spreads, like um, about the CNC machinist thing. Uh, that's the one I, I can be more certain about. Anyway, here's a quick recap of the events and the order they happened, uh, just in case you missed. So point one, the user ordered an RTX 4090 on launch day and received a package from Newegg. Gamers Nexus has retrieved uncut surveillance footage from the customer and reviewed it frame by frame in some sections. The shipping box appeared to have its outer packaging tape cut on one side when it was delivered to the customer. Next, we have uncut footage showing the customer arriving home some hours later. So this means that uh, from, I can see in the footage, the truck arrived, the guy get out of it and deliver the package. A couple hours later, you see the customer arrive and come up to inspect the package and document the package. The customer next contacted Newegg and claimed that the card was not present, filing the claim for a refund or RMA. And the customer used the photo that we saw the customer take in the porch camera footage. The customer had not yet posted on Reddit. Next, Newegg immediately locked the customer's account without any contact or communication. This is where we believe Newegg is at fault and uh, they have, as we understand it, improved at this point. Um, because of this instance. So you know, even in cases of investigating if a customer's claim is legitimate or is fraudulent, probably not the best solution to just basically ban their account and lock them out of any of their past order history, uh, plus any reasonable means to get the issue resolved if they are in fact telling the truth. It just sort of puts the customer in a panicked position where they've lost any tools beyond maybe a chargeback or the internet, Reddit, uh, to try and get a resolution. Next, within a few days of opening the ticket and after the account was locked, the customer posted the photo to Reddit. Next, Newegg began the process of reopening the customer's account and Gamers Nexus reached out to Newegg for comment. And next, after that, the customer's account was reopened. And finally, Newegg concluded its investigation and refunded the customer. When asked why it locked the customer's account without any communication, Newegg told us the following, quote, our current process has been to not email the customer initially that their account was blocked. If they contact us, we send an email explaining the process. We're reevaluating this process. And to add some context for just how hard this week was for Newegg and why we were getting blown up in our inbox about Newegg, uh, here's what that week looked like for them. So a user, obviously there's the one showing the weights, the user who posted the weights on Reddit. 
There was a user who posted to Reddit claiming to have received only two of seven items. That user also emailed us. The user claimed difficulty working with Newegg support. The user then noted that Newegg denied the claim after two weeks, and the user filed a chargeback with the bank. Now, that user eventually got refunded, and Newegg gave them a $100 gift card, and Newegg also, as a make good, gave them direct contact with the head of support. So we think this at least was resolved reasonably. Next, a user posted photos of receiving rocks rather than a GPU. There was also a user who posted photos receiving an empty box with packing and ESD bags, but no GPU. And this is where uh, it's one of the lessons I've learned or may relearned the past week. These issues are just too hard to prove without a doubt where the fault lies. It could be Newegg, it could be between Newegg and the customer. It could be the customer is fraudulent and a scammer and is trying to leverage the internet or media to get what they want. And um, in the case of this one, we don't feel that way. We put a lot of research into it. We got the uncut porch camera footage. Uh, I mean, I feel good enough. I'm not 100% confident though. So long story short, is it possible that the user tricked us? Of course it's possible. We don't think it's likely. And we've chosen to give the customer here the benefit of the doubt, just like we've chosen to give Newegg the benefit of the doubt and assume that the theft happened either at a factory or something or somewhere between Newegg and the customer. But that's the inherent challenge with this whole thing and why we're really not going to be covering this type of stuff in the future. Fraud is fairly uncommon as a percentage of total orders, of course. The company, the retailer, should never just assume by default that it's fraud. This is something we talked to Newegg about in the past and they're really working hard on assuming the customer is telling the truth. And I do think they're doing a better job here than they used to. Um, However, it's still a thing that can happen. It's just basically impossible to prove it at our level or really at Newegg's level either. So there's a few resolutions for those. Let's go through those too. For the story about the two of seven items, we already said it, the user received a refund. For the rocks, our understanding is the user received a refund. For the empty box with the ESD bags, uh, they also received a refund. The two of seven items, I understand how it happens because uh, I, I, we didn't talk about this one, but we had an issue with Newegg not too long ago where I had... Uh, through one of our staff accounts, ordered a, uh, I forget what it was, ordered something, overnighted it or next day, it, maybe it was a CPU. And that item came with uh, an accessory that was free and included. And the accessory arrived overnight. I think it was like a, a laptop bag or something. But the actual thing I wanted and needed overnight for work didn't arrive for three more days. So I can understand where there's some shipping logistics issues in there. So to recap, ultimately, the biggest problem here on Newegg side, we think, was freezing the customer accounts without communication. Our understanding is they've remedied that. That's good. We're satisfied with that answer. Um, the company, the VP contact that we liked from our meeting we had earlier in the year is no longer at Newegg. So that was disappointing to hear. Uh, however, clearly someone's taken some charge and is trying to do the right thing because they, I mean, they refunded all those people. So, um, and also in some instances in talking with them over the past few weeks, they refund people who don't make giant Reddit posts. So it's not always just a response to public pressure, which I think is the cynical reaction that they're going to get. Um, so they're in a challenging position trying to prove what happened to the GPU. Uh, there's a lot of cameras in their warehouse and they have metal detectors so they don't think that any employees would have the privacy to really steal something so they think it's happening after them but um you know ultimately there's insurance that helps with this too many instances of fraud claims though and shipping claims and their premiums go up and that'll get passed on to customers so that's something that uh, they have to think about our first story so a couple things here even though those reddit sleuth comments were as far as we can tell inaccurate and let us down a rabbit hole. I still think it was right to pull that story. I wouldn't say it was wasted time to spend the last few weeks just looking back into it. We could have just walked away from this, uh, which I obviously at one point wanted to do and just moved on. But I do think it's the right thing to just close out the storyline um, and talk about what we've learned here. So I wouldn't say it was wasted time because of that learning. Now, part of the reason it wasn't wasted time uh, is because of that qualifier where I said the Reddit sleuth comments, as far as we can tell, were inaccurate. Is that as far as we can tell that I, I don't like <laughs> that that has to be there. So anyway, we take pride in our reporting and uh, we'd rather be absolutely sure about our work than have any questions at all about the accuracy. We want you to be confident that we're not afraid to just kill a video if we think there's potential for a large inaccuracy. Uh, if there's minor ones, like for example, um, a mislabeling on a chart or maybe the script read is like 
saying 55%, but the actual number is like 51%. Stuff like that, we'll just post a top comment, which we've done that a lot. Um, you can always check the top comments on reviews for any of those minor corrections. But uh, anyway, the technical testing, it's easier to hit 99% confidence and just be like, yep, that's almost definitely right. Let's move forward. But it's a non-social issue, and this kind of becomes a social issue, so that's why it's harder. So this was a good reminder to not cover something we're not 100% comfortable with just because of audience demand. We had a lot of emails, tweets, things like that, because it was day after day, weights instead of a GPU, rocks instead of a GPU, missing GPU, two out of seven items, locked account, uh, customer service problems, whatever. And it was stacking up to be enough. We didn't really want to cover it, because a lot of those things are hard to prove unless it happens to us, like in the original New Egg story. But uh, I was like, OK, uh, all right, I got it. And there's enough pressure. And so we covered it. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing we've learned is um, trust the instincts there and make sure that we are comfortable with covering whatever it is. Really quick final notes here, too. So we're aware that um, there's like a magic upload or replacement in a video's place button. We don't have that button on YouTube. so. That's why uh, if there's something we don't like in one of our videos, like a major error, that's why it's going to go away and we'd upload a new one or something. We're not going to replace it in place. And honestly, I don't want that button anyway because it becomes a safety net that we don't want uh, that, that sort of permits error because you think it's easy to, to swap it. So that's not a normal button for creators to have, um, which I'm just mentioning because I don't want you thinking that there's going to be like an in-place change at some point. It would be a new one. And uh, additionally, uh, I mean, that's all the stuff we've learned. Newegg uh, clearly has also learned because it changed its policy. It is not assuming a fraudulent customer at the outset, and it's not starting with freezing accounts, at least as we understand it. Uh, and so we're happy with that if that's true. Now, Newegg still has a lot of things to improve, um, clearly, but uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll revisit that at some point and see how they're doing. So for now, what we hope you've learned is that if we skip a story, there's probably a good reason. OK, let's get into the last topic. Now, for the last story, everyone's favorite manufacturer of, let's be fair, beige and brown fans, they got two colors in one. Most fans just do one color. Noctua does two. They've launched a new line of plastic spacers called the NA-IS-1. The company claims these 5 millimeter bits of plastic will provide both airflow and acoustic advantages for fans in specific configurations, mostly used as pull or suction orientation, where the fan has to pull air through something that is obstructing it, like a perforated case panel or radiator. Now, in practice, this makes sense. Anytime you can get some extra spacing from the fan to the surface of whatever it's up against, it's going to benefit the fan. It can spread uh, its force across the whole inner surface of that. So you see this with cases, too, where pushing it right up against the mesh versus pulling it back, say, an inch it really does have a profound impact on performance. It also allows it to spread the air as it might more naturally spread it instead of forcing it through a very uh, constrained area. So anyway, the spacer is attached to one side of the fan using the same holes that are normally used to hold the fan's rubber corners in place, for Noctua that is. You can then use any standard self-tapping fan screw. And Noctua's anti-vibration rubber mounts also work, or the 35 mil uh, radiator screws to secure the assembly in place. Noctua published its own performance review with multiple 120 and 140 mil fans in different applications. It tested them against a panel with round hexagonal and slit type holes, as well as water cooling radiators. Noctua claims an average sound pressure reduction of 2 dBA, depending on the fan and situation. It even shows a few situations where the spacer actually hurt performance or noise, so it's nice to see a company not just cut that out when uh, it has data that's maybe unfavorable. As for price, they're available in packs of two for 15 bucks. Uh, something you can maybe add to your 120 or 140 fans on your case if you need something to do. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab one of our coaster packs. We have more of the Coaster Pack 2 that have just gotten in, and they're shipping and in stock now. And thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.